So welcome everyone to um, the second session of the MTSS Implementation Toolbox series. Um, I'm excited to have you all here to go over um, two new tools that um, are actually internally created. They're modeled off of a couple of tools that are actually out um, in, the, in the world of MTSS, um, but that I have been working internally with my um, an MTSS work group here inside the DOE to kind of um, tweak and modify for Maine schools and Maine students. Um, so I'm excited for today's session. Uh, let's see. So the way that this session is going to go is, um, so there's essentially like, there's three parts to the session. First, we're going to do a quick overview of Maine's MTSS framework, because I do feel like that's an important foundation for all of the work that's done in the toolbox series, um, as well as um, then we'll move into the first tool. And once I've presented the first tool, um, my goal is to then break you out into breakout rooms where you have an opportunity to discuss um, anything that you want related to what you learn about that tool. Um, it's a good chance for you to talk about whether you're doing things similarly um, in your schools and or if you have questions about how certain parts of the tool might be used in your setting or in your situation. Um, it's a good chance to give me feedback on, on things that you feel might need some feedback um, if that's the case. And also um, it's just a good opportunity to kind of connect and network with um, your colleagues from across the state. Then we'll come back and I will introduce the second tool to you. Um, and then the same thing will happen. So then we'll go off into breakout rooms again for a few moments for, for a few moments for you to have an opportunity to chat about that second tool. Um, and then we'll come together at the end and um, leave it open for any other questions that folks may have um, based on the two tools that we learn about today. So are there any questions about the format for today's session? Okay, awesome. So let me just share my screen here. Give me one. Sorry about that. I went to open one slideshow and four opened. So I must have hit them all as I was navigating through. Um, okay. So let me just open up this for you to see a little better. So if you attend more than one of the toolbox series sessions, you're going to become very well versed in the main MTSS framework uh, because we are going to cover this at the beginning of each um, of the toolbox sessions. Um, just so that you become um, very aware of the 541 model that is being um, used to explain and um, teach about Maine's MTSS framework, but, as, but also so that you have a deep understanding of how each of the tools that are featured during the toolbox series relate to these critical components, the four delivery pillars, and then the, the overall big idea um, of means MTSS. Um, so perhaps towards the end of the year, I may ask for volunteers to, um, I'm just kidding, I won't ask for volunteers to do the MTSS explanation framework, even though maybe it's not such a bad idea. Um, okay, so means MTSS uh, framework really comes down to what I'm calling the 541. So there are five critical implementation components. There are four 
essential delivery pillars. And then there's one main big idea about Maine's MTSS. And so the five critical components are, number one, schools have a leadership team that uses live data to improve instruction. And the key word of that element or that critical component is actually live for live data. Um, we operate under this idea that data has a life cycle and it has a shelf life. And so when data is collected and not used um, intentionally to create um, action steps or to create planning for outcomes, things that you're working towards, eventually over time, that data is not usable. And the lifespan of that data is pretty short compared to some some of types of data that we collect. And then when we go to look at the result of the data to make decisions about it. So any data that you're using to make decisions to improve teaching and learning ultimately should have um, a 10 to 14 day life cycle on data collection. Now, I know what some people are thinking, and that's, well, the state of Maine collects state data, and we don't get that until the fall or until, you know, much, much later. And while that is true, we also wouldn't make, um, we use that data to, to look at the overall picture, to create a snapshot of how schools are doing, but that data isn't necessarily useful, and I will, I will go all the way to the end of my career saying this, it's not necessarily useful for making actionable steps, but you would use additional data to, uh, you might use that data to figure out where you wanna collect more data or where you wanna explore some more for some of that more live action decision-making. So that's number one, is using live data to improve teaching and learning. Number two is that schools utilize grade level teams as well as their school-wide school, their school -wide level team to elevate universal instructional integrity. They're monitoring student response to instruction and support, and they're identifying growth areas for their instructional practice. Now, grade level teams are a critical component of a school-wide MTSS. Sometimes schools utilize um, PLCs, and a PLC could be considered a grade level team for their MTSS, as long as that grade level team is um, effectively utilizing a problem solving process, data review, and they are making, they're using that time to identify um, growth areas for instructional practices and making decisions on their instructional practice. So a PLC meeting, um, so are some of the meetings that I've attended, maybe they're doing other types of meeting, other types of planning, all of which are important, but may, may or may not be considered the grade level team meeting that would be used in a full-scale school-wide MTSS. Number three, schools utilize effective universal instruction, otherwise known as tier one, for all students, regardless of IEP, 504, multilingual learning, et cetera, and that it, they ensure relevant and timely access to additional and intensified support when indicated. You will never hear me use the phrase tier one intervention, ever. Like I will never ask you what you're doing for tier one interventions because I don't believe that tier one intervention is a thing. Tier one is a prevention level and, it, and it, it's all intervention in, in a lot of ways, especially in main schools where we have a very high level of special education referral. We have a very high level of, um, of intensive intervention needs across the state. Um, so your tier one is your universal instruction for all students, including those that have these other types of indicators that they are receiving some other type of instruction, whether it's an IEP instruction, 504 modification, or anything to that nature. And so the way that school-wide MTSS is built from our perspective is that tier one is not an intervention level. Tier one is your prevention level. And then we intensify layers um, from there, depending on the use of that data and deciding how we're going to respond to student to instruction and instructional practice. Number four, and number four may seem um, may seem self-explanatory, but it's probably one of the hardest to achieve when working towards implementation of MTSS frameworks in schools. And that is that schools have a library of evidence-based resources 
and that they ensure equitable access for all students, regardless of eligibility for special education or other student imports. So what do I mean by having a library of evidence-based resources that is equitable access for all students? One thing that I tend to see a lot and I experience as a classroom educator is that many times different programs or different resources or even different people or perhaps a room in the school or an area of the school are reserved for certain tiers, right? So this program and this set of, of, of time and space is for tier two, and this is for tier three, and this is for special education. And when we do that, we are inadvertently contributing to the fail first model of a traditional response to intervention slash MTSS framework. It's not something that I don't think was ever intended to happen, but is way more common. And I think we need to start normalizing the idea that when we pigeonhole programs and we gatekeep other types of resources to a certain point at which students have failed enough that they have access to it, that's not equitable access for all students when we're using data to indicate that a certain intervention or a certain program or a certain approach may have been indicated much sooner and could have helped that student much sooner. When you walk into a public library, for example, it's unlikely that you walk into a public library and if you go to the media section and pull out, you know, some, I don't know, let's keep it, maybe like, you know, you, you just picked up a brand new uh, cassette tape player because they're all the rage now and believe it or not, and you decided that you want to go pick up some cassettes and you want to play a cassette tape in your new cassette player. It's unlikely that if you were to walk into that public library, that that librarian is going to be like, you don't have access to that because this is 2024 and most people don't have a cassette player right now. Or you already saw that, so you're not going to be able to take that movie out this week or some other gate that you would have to jump over in order to get access to that material. On the other hand, schools tend to tend to set themselves up that, that way, that only certain things are reserved for certain people at certain times. And while I can understand where it came from, we need to start broadening our lens to look at how we can create more open resource libraries for our students so that we aren't, we aren't moving kids accidentally towards failure thresholds before giving them the services um, and the interventions and the um, evidence-based practices that they could otherwise have had access to um, that may have helped them sooner or in, in, at an earlier time. And then number five, the fi fifth critical component is that schools create dynamic partnerships with families and community members designed to support and empower family and community engagement. And the key word in that critical component is the dynamic for dynamic partnerships. Um, just ensuring that your communication avenues and the relationships and communication that you're building with your community and your families are multi-directional um, and not just one way. So, you know, sending out a newsletter, sending out an email, sending out a phone call, um, and then and not establishing sort of that, that bi-directional um, opportunity for family, school, and community to all be working you know, symbiotically to meet the needs of students. And, sorry. And then that brings me to the second um, of Maine's MTSS frameworks. That was the five critical components, components. And now we have the four implementation pillars. The four implementation pillars really come down to these four things, right? So you've got these, these five critical ideas. How do we put those critical ideas into motion? And to put them into motion, um, it comes down to these four things. We're going to start with problem solving on the right and then work our way around the circle. So a critical delivery pillar for a full-scale MTSS is having a problem solving model that is consistent across the school, used regularly, and that everybody knows how to do. So everybody would be trained from your classroom teachers to your ed techs to your leadership team in the same consistent problem solving model so that all the language about how to use the model and all of the implementation of how to use the model are shared across the school so that it can be used across domain and across student need. How are students doing with the content or the skill being taught? 
and what are we going to do about it? And then also shortening up those data um, cycles or those problem solving cycles into smaller chunks so that we can be absolutely sure that what we're doing is having the effect that we want it to do. Moving down to the bottom of the circle, educator support. Um, we believe that A plus B equals C, that change for students lies in the behavior of the adults. So A, adults, plus B, their behavior equals C, change for students. And the educator support system, we don't get into um, too deeply um, in today's um, toolbox session, but it's important to know that your educator support system is equally as important as the interventions that you're spending thousands of dollars on to bring into your school that you think are going to meet the needs of the students that are in front of you. And that's critical um, because we have been taught to believe that MTSS is an intervention system. And really it's a, it's a systems approach of how you are utilizing and maintaining the people that are delivering the MTSS and your educators are your drivers of that MTSS. And so having a support system in place is critical for that. The third is blended delivery. We believe that it's all students, all educators, all hands on deck, all the time. And really looking at how can we be sure that if we are a bar school and we're using PBIS and we're using second step, how do we blend these models together to to maximize their impact and create cultures and climates of learning that all students have access to. And then finally, that brings me to tier one. We believe in a full-scale MTSS that it's prevention over intervention. It's instructional practice for all students and that we were all, and with that all hands on deck approach, we are looking at how can we maximize our tier one to ward off problems before they become problems. I'm never, ever, ever saying that you should not be paying attention to your tier three. That would be ridiculous. But I am saying that at, at times, or especially when we get into a discussion about MTSS, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about your tier one because you'd be surprised at how often we can solve tier three problems by finding the root cause, which in many instances exists within that tier one setting. Um, okay, yes, the slide is blurry. <laughs> and I have somebody working with me um, on that. There was a question in the chat about whether the slide was blurry. You are not losing your mind. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so that's where I'll stop in terms of the MTSS framework. And now we will jump into segment two of today, which is looking at um, the first of tool of two internal tools that are being um, that are being created. And the first one is, we are calling it um, a multi-tiered instructional matrix. So in multi-tiered instructional matrix. And this is modeled after the SWIFT Center, actually. Um, if you've heard of the SWIFT Center, um, they are pioneers in school-wide um, MTSS implementation. Um, if you've been in any book studies with me, you know that I am a big fan of the book Leading Equity-Based MTSS for All Students, which is written by um, Amy McCart and um, Deb Miller. And one of, the, um, one of the tools that they use when they are um, working with schools to develop full-scale school-wide MTSS is they work on um, a process called resource mapping. And in that process of resource mapping, they use or they teach how to use an instructional um, matrix that helps to organize and pre-plan, in some cases, um, decision rules and cutoff points that all students would be um, would have access to when needed. And then it gets modified based on the response of, of that student's response to the intervention. And so over time, um, I have taken this and through nearly five years of working with schools and really learning um, the ins and outs of what main schools need and what main students need, um, I've brought in a very small work group to sort of analyze the instructional matrix that is featured in that book and really looking at it through um, the eyes of what main schools um, may be able to implement in their in their settings in order to be able to achieve similar results that the matrix achieved um, during, you know, when used um, in that full-scale MTSS. 
And so essentially it's broken down um, into a couple of different, um, into a couple of different areas. So we have um, a tier one section where we answer the questions of what and uh, what and when. So what is being done and when is it being done? We break down and fill in um, screening that's being done at that tier one level. So what is screened, who is screening it, when is it administered, and when is it reviewed by? So that we have we have a plan for and know when our screening data or our testing data is being utilized and when we are going to actually use it for decision making. And then we do some pre-planning as a part one for data review and decision rules. And so at the tier one, and then your data, your data review and your decision rules changes a little bit depending on the tier that you're functioning in. And so at the, and then it's also broken down into a couple of different levels. So you'll see, I don't know if you can see, let's see if I can find my annotate tool right here. So you'll see right here that there is a grade level data review and decision rules. And apparently I can't annotate and scroll. There's a class level, which is right here. And that would be considered part two of data review and decision rules. And then there's a student level, which is, oh, see that? The annotation stays right there. There's a student level data review and decision rules. And then we scroll down even farther, and then you'll notice that there is an identified student groups, which would be a part four of data review and decision rules. And you would go through multiple layers of data review and decision rules until you have met the needs of all of the learners that you have that, that you are serving, um, right down to your identified student groups. Now, what's important about this matrix and what makes this, um, and what makes this process special is that a lot of times, maybe this doesn't happen in your school, but I can tell you that it, it is one of the things that I have found um, just over time with schools that I, that I work with and, and, and help is that we often look at our data from a 25, like from almost like a quartile perspective or like I'll have, okay, well, here's my lowest 25. These are the students that I'm gonna put into a special, in, into get them, you know, into intervention. And without looking at all of the data as, as a whole. And so when looking at it from this perspective, there's a couple of different things that you would do with your data. Um, the first, when looking at it from a grade level, your very first look at your data is going to be anonymous. You're going to remove the student names from the data, and you might even shake it up a bit through like a randomizer so that you, and especially for smaller schools that might only have one class per grade level, or you have a teacher that knows and can intuitively remember that the ninth student down is Johnny. It's always Johnny, and I always know because that's where his name falls alphabetically. Because that first look of data at the grade level and the classroom level, the first look, and there are multiple, but the first look is from an anonymous perspective because we want to just basically ask the question of how are kids doing with instruction if, if everything was controlled for just instruction? How's it going? And then the decisions that you're gonna make answering that question are a little different than the decisions that you're going to make when you look at that class data again, or that grade level data again, and then see, okay, well, I know this about this student and this about this student and this about this app, you know, this situation, because those decisions are going to be a lot different. But in order for us to move the needle of, of opportunity for kids, and the and in order for us to be able to move that needle to, um, to move our average, we've got to start targeting larger groups of students in order to move the average um, because if doing it student by student really has shown over the last 40 years to not be as effective as we would like it to be. So this is breaking down, broken down into a couple of different segments. So your first look at your data, part one, is gonna be at a grade level. And at the tier one, you're going to have some if then statements. So if the group composite and or subtest indicator or MAP score is at least 70, 80%, then continue high quality universal design for instruction and progress monitor using universal screeners. What does that mean? Basically that's saying is that if you look at a grade level and 70 to 80% of your students are meeting expectation benchmark, then keep doing what you're doing. What you're doing is working and kids are, they're succeeding. 
they're thriving most likely. Um, and it's most likely that your culture and your climate are probably pretty good too, because this is the cream of the crop. This is what we're this is what we're aiming for. This is what we want our MTSS to do. And then we have a couple of different pathways. And these hopefully are not going to be named pathways forever. In fact, if you in your discussion when we break out in about five minutes, um, if in your discussion, if you have a better name for that, please share it because right now they're called pathways, and I don't necessarily think that that's accurate for what it's intended to do. But the additional support pathway or pathway A, you have another set of if then of if then statements. So if grade composite and or subtest indicator or map is below 70%, <clears throat> then consider providing additional instructional support and progress monitor at four week intervals until screening indicates at or above 70% meeting benchmark. And then you have pathway B, which is going to be your tier three, pathway C, which is going to be your, um, your gifted and maximized or your accelerated learners, like your gifted and talented students. And pathway D is actually going to be your highly gifted students. So we've taken like talent, your, your highly talented pool and the gifted pool, and we've broken them out into two different pathways. But you can see how the if then statements all work the same, depending on which pathway or which, if, or which pathway you happen to be looking at you happen to be looking at. And then once part one is done and you've made some decisions, and we're not gonna talk about problem solving process today because today's just sharing the tool, um, then you would go and you would do this process again. And you would do your, your part two of your data review and decision rules at the class level. And then you would conduct it again at a student level. And then you would conduct it again for your identified student groups. The identified student groups um, section is actually super important here because when you're looking at an identified student group, and when I say student group, I mean um, maybe like your maybe low SES, it could be your IEP students, could be students that have 504s, could be students that speak more than like one language or are learning English as a second language or third or fourth language. It's important for us to know how our, pro our processes and our instruction are working for that particular student group in order for us to be truly culturally informed and culturally responsive, responsive to their needs. And so when you are finished at your tier one, tier two, and tier three level of your data review, you are going to wanna make sure that you're applying that same data review process to those individual student groups. Because if you have a student group that is indicating that they are below 70 to 80% of meeting, uh, of meeting um, benchmark or meeting needs or expectations in the general education setting, you have a program identification or a program review that needs to happen. So if less than 70% of any of those student groups are meeting benchmark, then you need to conduct a program review to identify areas of need. This and then, so this is going to be in addition to any individual services that those students may be receiving. Um, because we wanna know that what we're doing is responsive to those individual student groups, as well as just our general, our, our students that don't have any um, indication or any additional supports that they're receiving. And then at the bottom of the tool, um, you will see that there's a place for you to conduct the rest of that, of that um, resource mapping. And one clunky thing about the tool is that I only have two spots for each domain. So I've broken it down into literacy and reading, math, social, emotional, attendance, and behavior. There's also a section down here for secondary. So what's the course name? What's the curriculum or program that's being used? Who's the personnel, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so anybody that's utilizing this tool in their school would need to add lines if they're using more than two, which most of them are, um, using more than two um, curriculums and programs for literacy and reading instruction, math, et cetera, et cetera, to get the idea. I have not yet figured out how to make this a streamlined document, but also make it so that it's expandable for folks to be able to expand for the multiple without having too many documents, too many links, too many things like that. The idea of creating that library where everything is all in one piece. So if you have suggestions for that, um, I am all ears for that as well. Um, okay, so here is the tiered instruction matrix tool. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break us off into, um, into breakout rooms for about 10 minutes for you to have an opportunity to um, look at this document 
and let me make sure I actually have the link for you to do this because this is a Word doc that's firewall now when I think about it. Um, okay, give me a moment. Let's see. There it is. Link. Come on. Apologize. Okay, so. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Let's see if this link works for you in your breakout room. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break you off into rooms because I know you can't care, you can't see the original um, the original links when you are actually in. So like once you get to the breakout room, so I'm gonna hop into each room and drop the link for you um, once you're all in there. So I will see you in just a few moments. Hang tight if I don't get to you right off.
How's it going? You would think after almost five years that I wouldn't close breakout rooms before they're supposed to be closed, but apparently that is not the case here. All right, um, so we are gonna let everybody come back because there's apparently there's nothing you can do to stop it too. Once you've closed your room, that's it. You can't cancel. Um, so once everybody is back, I will send you back to your breakout rooms because you just got the link. And we're gonna stay calm. <laughs> Okay, so when I tried to leave the last breakout room, I actually hit close breakout rooms, which is not what I intended to do. So um, I'm going to open the rooms again and we will come back at 420. Okay, at 420. Um, because I want to give folks time to be able to to chat about things. So sorry about that. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Uh, when you came to breakout room three, it wasn't actually a link, it was just text. We couldn't like open anything from it. Oh, okay. Let me drop it in the chat and then maybe you can copy it here. Okay. And then um, see if that works for you. You should be able to right click and copy it and then. Okay, we did that last time and it brought us to like Swift schools. Mm -hmm. That's what it's doing for me too. It didn't take you to the, okay. Let's it, see if that's I... what happened to me too, but, and then you, it, there's a, it says um, after the picture down below the image, it says download a fillable form. And then I was able to open it. But is it the one that I showed you on the share screen or is it Swift schools? It's a Swift oh, it's the Swift. Yeah, it is a different one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see if I can fix this for you because that's not the one that I want you looking at. I want you looking at the main one. Oh, okay. Um, all right. So let's see, I'm gonna do this. Never dreamed I would miss. Uh, 
teams with teams this is a lot easier i never thought i would say that in my out loud voice um okay so let me try here Okay, so do you see it now? No? Interesting, okay. Well. Andrea, I tried that file, what you just put in, and it says, it, it's, uh, it says uh, file couldn't be accessed. Okay, all right. Well, here's what we're gonna do then. Um, I'm going to pull, pull folks back from the breakout rooms. We'll go over the second tool and then I will attach these as attachments and you can review them on your own, I guess is gonna be the best way to do this. Do it that way. Not ideal, but that's okay. Okay, folks, I pulled you all back because I realized through um, some discussion with others that the link that I was sending you, um, even though on my side of the world shows up as my instructional matrix, it turns out the website that it's sending you to is actually Swift School's website. Um, and I didn't want you reviewing that. I want you reviewing the main one. <laughs> so I pulled you all back and we're going to punt a little bit. So what I'll do now is we are, you're missing out on the opportunity to discuss um, the, the tool with others that are in the meeting. Um, but I think it's important that you get access to both tools. And then what I'll do is after this, I'll go into Zoom and um, because your email will all show up to me as attendees for today's session, I will send you a PDF of each of the tools that you can then review. And if you have specific feedback that you wanna give, um, feel free to just send me an email, like what, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you have questions on. Um, and then um, I can revisit doing another, perhaps another session similar to this um, once I have transferred these documents into a form that is accessible um, to everybody. Um, does, that, that, does that work? Okay, good. All right, so first that, that was the instructional matrix tool. Um, and the second tool that I wanted to share with you in today's session is the um, student intervention progress note. This is another tool that um, has been developed or is, is being, being developed internally. Um, and it is actually modeled not after um, any book or anything that is being done um, that I know of, you know, um, say like through SWIFT schools or anywhere else, but it is a model that a school in Maine was using um, to change from their highly targeted, you know, 
traditional RTI, you know, tier one interventions, tier two interventions, tier three interventions to a more holistic, whole student school, MTSS school framework. Um, and so um, over some discussion with that school and some discussion with some folks internally, we've worked together to create what we're calling the student intervention progress note. Now, the idea here is that this note is used at the classroom teacher level um, to monitor and track additional supports that have to meet two qualifications. So the first is that increases in time, and the second is that it increases intensity. To, it, it, it increases in intensity. The other thing about this tool that is unique that we don't often see is that every student in a class has one of these progress notes not just students that you notice are falling behind or not just students that you notice are, you know, not getting the content or that you're giving an extra small group to or some one-on-one -on -one time to. Every student in the classroom has one of these progress notes. Um, you may never use it for a student and that's fine. But the idea being is that we want to create a situation where we have structure and autonomy that are existing in the same space. And so when a student is indicating that they need additional supports, this doesn't that doesn't start after a certain amount of time and then we request a meeting. That starts when, hey, I'm noticing that this student is having difficulty with, you know, could be an SEL focus, it could be a literacy focus. It, it's whatever that they it's whatever that they have indicated that they need. And then we start to monitor that right from the very first couple of times that we see it. Now, this may seem like a lot in isolation because it can be a lot in isolation. You have to understand that this tool would be, um, the re when you would use this tool or when you would adopt a tool like this in your setting would be when you are working towards moving towards a school-wide MTSS model. And so some other things would be in place, like you have a dedicated intervention block that you're using, or you have a dedicated um, process that you're using for providing, you know, um, interventions to your students, you know, across your school. And so you would, you would actually ask yourself, like, does this progress monitoring, uh, this, does this progress note fit with the model that we're currently using? And, or, hey, this progress note could help us. What about our model might we have to change in order to implement um, a tool such as this? And so, like I said, everybody in the, in the class gets one. And the purpose is, you know, you're going to use this note to monitor a student's progress. And then once that student has achieved 80% um, of that skill or that content over three consecutive days, you're going to staple the progress note to the work that's being done. And then you're going to keep it in a file. This particular school used what they were calling the black box method. The black bo box method, um, black box method. If you, you know, we all know what a black box is, right? So airplanes have them and they record basically everything that's happening on that airplane in running time. And so what they were using was a, a basically like a milk crate box. And then inside that milk crate box, every student had a file and every student had a progress note in that file. Now, what would happen was all of their tier two interventions came to them. So they were utilizing an intervention team Rather than sending students out of the room, they were sending adults to the room and they were doing it through a particularly um, specific setup, like MTSS scheduling setup. Now, what would happen is those interventionists, one, two, didn't matter, you know, depending on how many students, uh, how many that particular class or that grade level needed at the time, they would go to the room and they automatically knew to go to this box and pull out the folder of students that the teacher had indicated that day could use some additional support in whatever it was that they were learning. Now, because that that intervention team was going to that classroom at the same time every day, they may have to look at, you know, some things that happened at the end of the day, the day before, but every day as the classroom was getting an opportunity for some interventionists to come in and provide support to these students. And so then what would happen is either through either, um, through the, either the interventionist an ed tech or the classroom teacher themselves, they would decide like what is the intervention or what is the additional support that's going to be provided. They would attach it to this form and then the interventionist automatically knew to go to get to that folder, pull the information out of the folder, conduct that small group with that either it was either either one-on-one -on -one or a small group if there are multiple students working on it, 
do the intervention, track their progress on this progress note, and then put that student's file or their form back in the folder. If it was a, if it's a student that isn't mastering it over the course of one day, maybe two days, then you know you are looking for three consecutive days of showing that they are getting this skill. Now you can understand that over time there may be students that have multiple of these that you're trying to get through at that tier two setting. It's going you're going to have an indication of when you need to increase to a tier three intensity a lot sooner than waiting for eight weeks, twelve weeks, sixteen weeks, whatever you know the model is that you might currently be using, so that we can get kids to that tier three level intensity a lot faster and not waiting half a school year or or longer in some cases in order to try to get a student some support. This particular tool also has been designed um, with the whole student framework that Main is using in mind. So um, each feature on the screen, it relates in some way to the whole student framework. So from your lesson focus that's aligned with core instruction, the form itself is meant to challenge and support students. You're going to write down who the interventionist is that's working on this and what the instructional strategy was that they're using. I'll use my annotate tool so you can see me. We're going to look at um, like, how is the student feeling or doing? Why is my annotate not working? Oh, um, so that you are monitoring how they were feeling at the beginning and at the end of that time with you. And they're gonna track their opportunities. How many opportunities did they have to show that particular skill or that particular piece of content and then you would track that um, in here, hopefully doing some kind of level of tracking where you can track whether they're, you know, getting 80% or not. So let's say, you know, three out of five, that's 80%. Okay, so on this day, they got 80%. Any special notes that you want the teacher to know? And then um, and so you would write those notes there. Once that child or that student has achieved 80%, we- Andrea? Yep. We don't see anything. You can't see it. You can't see anything? I can I see it. I can't see. I'm only seeing you and everybody else. I can see it. Oh, I just saw it now. Got it. Okay. Um. All right, I'm not sure how to clear the annotation though. Do we know how to do that? I'm trying all these new things and try new things, people, they said. It'll be easy, they said. Okay, so now at the bottom, there's a couple of different things for you to consider. So um, if at any point you're going to um, use intervention or curriculum that was not originally planned for, you're going, to, you're going to indicate that. So let's say you are the interventionist and you are using a curriculum and you're noticing that it's just not, it doesn't seem to be working and you decide that you're gonna make a change. You're gonna, you're gonna mark that change on this form so that you have a record of what it was that you've been doing. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, we wanna know if you're using things that you're, that, you, that you're trained in knowing how to do, but also is it an evidence-based curriculum that you're using? And if it's not, that's not always a bad thing. It just means that we wanna know what you've been trying. Also, all interventions are strategies, but not all strategies are intervention. An intervention has to fit a certain um, number of criteria. For example, um, I, I, I tend to use the um, FT squared to remind myself that it needs to narrow in focus, which would be the F. It needs to increase in time, which would be one of your Ts. And then it needs to be teacher directed, which would be your other T. So if you were to put something on this line here that you indicated that you used a different intervention, you may or may not be actually doing an intervention. We want to know what you're doing to see if it's having an impact on these kids. You would give a quick rationale for the change, and then are you trained in that intervention? Just yes or no, um, so that we can have an idea of keeping track of and being able to provide support, remember that educator support system, for our interventionists that are working with these kids. And then over time, you would you would have to say, okay, well, let's say after so many weeks, maybe maybe two or three weeks, student has not had three consecutive days where they show that they're getting this. We need to figure out what we're going to do. Are we going to fade supports? Or are we going to in increase instructional intensity and move them towards more of a tier three model um, rather than the tier two model? 
Um, so this particular process was being used in a main school and they were having pretty big results with this monitoring tool. And it wasn't a small school either. I wanted to make sure that this was a school that had multiple classes in multiple grade levels um, because there's multiple challenges that come from having a school with just one third grade versus say four third grades, right? And so making sure that this was an average size school um, to make sure that it's going to work for the average main school that, that's utilizing it. Um, okay, so that is the second tool. So we got in just under the wire, it is 4.30 and I wanna honor your time. So what I will do um, is, unfortunately you don't get a chance to chat with each other, um, but what I will do is I will look at the attendance um, roster through Zoom and I will send a PDF copy of each of, the, of these tools to you for you to have. Um, and if you have feedback or questions or you wanna chat about any of the tools, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. These haven't been widely released yet to everybody in Maine simply because I wanna make sure that I've received um, enough you know, inquiry and feedback on the tools so that we know that they're gonna be useful and helpful for folks um, as they work towards school-wide MTSS. And that's it. Thanks for coming today and go enjoy some sunshine this afternoon if you can. Andrea, is there a um, certificate for hours for research coming to? So um, I will send out a link to the certificate with the link um, to the email. Perfect. I mean, Thank the, you. To, to the tools. Yeah. <laughs> Thank gotcha. You. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for coming.